Hello, and welcome back to that podcast at the intersection of faith and fear, where every week, and especially this year, and especially this episode, we discuss what scares us in order to find what saves us. This is the fear of God. Speaking to you right now is one of your hosts, Nathan Rouse, and typically with me is fellow co-host, Reed Lackey. And well, guys, he was here, but he was kind of favoring his his uh mouth a little bit and he said he had to go treat some tooth pain he was dealing with i, I hope he's okay because that stuff is tough in the meantime allow me to welcome you and all of your teeth back into our big series for this year what scares us slash what saves us a series defined by you You've been submitting your stories of films and media that instilled or stoked a certain fearful imagining in you, and we are going to be covering them here on the show. But before I get ahead of myself, here at The Fear of God, we explore. We don't explain, except for right now when I explain that you can listen to The Fear of God at your nearest podcast platform. You can watch The Fear of God on YouTube, and you can browse The Fear of God on the web at thefearofgodpodcast.com, where you will find... Read! Hey! Hey, buddy! You doing okay? Well, hey there, Mr. Oh. Rouse. How you oh, doing? This? No. I'm so glad to be we here. We went from toothache to toothless. Toothless? I Tooth. guess I got that Mountain Dew mouth. <laughs> 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 they wow. Told, they told me. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, can't, no. I can't sustain that for very long. I love long. it. Yeah, that's intense. <laughs> um, oh, so, Riri, oh. welcome back. You're here. So I'm here. I'm we are. Here. Uh, we're in the middle of what scares us. This is a fun series. Last week I'm we had a uh, listener and new on pod friend of the fog Asia on to discuss Rosemary's baby. That was a, that was an intense flick. I absolutely, absolutely. If you're I, not, I, yeah, I, 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 I bet. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be a mini you go. <laughs> no, well, I was just going to say, if you haven't checked that out yet, like go check no. it out. Boy, we, we went to some volcanic places. Yeah. And, and watch the movie. It's a fun yeah. frolic um almost a I, I think by the end we had concluded it was really more of a rom-com yeah, than uh yeah. than, you know than anything else so speaking of rom-coms that was the this week away. we're talking about channel zero season one i mean it is right it is I the mean, lightest affair it, it's friends or seinfeld or candle or cove, candle cove. I mean, like oh my gosh i mean you know jawbone that's, pirate person yeah. they are that's, that's a right laughing stock it's gonna be come on <laughs> It's, it's it's in the right name. there. It's, in the <laughs> it's right there. Like nothing. No, nothing. To, can no. I, it's like uh no, I won't share. I was gonna say no. Simpsons. Wow. Joke. I feel like okay. I share Simpsons you do those a lot. all the time. It's okay. Yeah, so, it's okay. so I'm gonna. I'm I mean, gonna it's the number one show of all time according to Sepp and Wall and Sites. Um. Know. So Reed, do we have any business we need to attend to? Uh, you know, join join the Facebook group and and make sure that you uh you know leave us an iTunes <clears> review <throat> and and just in general like. You know, like I, we don't say this enough, but we have an email, fearofgodpodcast at gmail dot com. Like, share your thoughts on the show. We love to hear from listeners, and uh, whether it be through the Facebook group or through an iTunes review or anything, like, just share your thoughts. If you enjoy what we do, if you show up uh, every week or even every occasional week and enjoy what we do, we'd love to hear from you. It would uh, it would make our day. So so yeah, I I, I would like to just throw that out there by any means uh, that you have, either comment on a on the website or send us an email or something sure uh, <laughs> something there's something <laughs> wow I, I, I didn't mean to come off as if like we have no interaction plenty of people interact yeah. repeatedly but i just love hearing from listeners it's, it's so, okay Reed. It's yes. all right we're we're with you um how about you any business no yes <laughs> <laughs> not really i'm good um i do, ha I do I, have one more thing what you want <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Dr. Teeth. What you listening to? Oh, Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. Oh, my yeah. goodness. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. You sound like a cousin of Statler and Waldorf <laughs> instead. I don't Marley know why. And Marley and Marley. I don't know Blackie why. The and moment, Nathan. The, one, the moment that I, like, I don't know why when I try to intimate toothlessness, I immediately go to age and southern. It's immediately like this old southern that's, guy who's like, that's, hey, well, 
Do, it's a bit of a reflection of the old soul that is lacking. It's like that's probably true. That's probably the other thing that I almost did is uh, that's old. You, that's old terrible. This is going. Oh man, this is going back. I remember <laughs> when we were in the early days when we were both out in California, like in the early days. And I remember I stumbled upon a little pineapple flavored soda called Cactus Cooler. And I remember you always used to be like, <laughs> it was really like, you got your Cactus Cooler. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> you just busted into like this aught, you know, like the 19 aughts prospector or something. Yeah. And you're just like, you got your, you got your cactus I almost, cooler. I almost was like, you want to talk about a candle pew, cooler? Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Look at old Lackey with his cactus cooler. Man, Man was, cactus cooler. They, they probably don't even, even exist anymore. No, I, I have just, a soda in the fridge right now. Of cactus cooler. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So around. what you're watching, what you're reading, what you're listening to, what you're drinking. There you go. I did, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, that wasn't my, that wasn't my entry. Mm. Um, nope. You only get one. <laughs> so, okay. So listen, um, I want to share this with a little shout out to a friend of the show and friend of ours, Blake Collier, um, who had recommended to us uh, just as a, just sort of a general, hey, this book is really good. Um, a book that I just finished. Uh, it's a novel uh, by John Langan. It's my first novel uh, that I'm reading by him. It's called The Fisherman. And uh, it's a fascinating horror story. Uh, it starts off with these two men who have both mutually lost uh, just a tremendous amount in their lives, uh, both lost spouses. One of them lost spouse and children. And um, they connect over a mutual desire to, as fishermen, they just enjoy the prospect of fishing. Of fishing. And uh, then they, uh, where the plot kind of turns is at one point, one of them, the friend of the narrator, has discovered a new fishing location that they're going to go to. And on their way there, they stop in a diner and somebody in this diner finds out where they are going and proceeds to tell this story about the legend of this place to which they are headed. So the, the novel is really formed in three sort of phases. The first phase being introducing us to our two main characters. The second phase, which actually comprises most of the book, is the, the legend of this creek. And it is creepy as crap like it's what it's it was one of those rare experiences where i was reading the book like sunday afternoon and was creeping myself out uh in some of what was what was being shared about this story it just has a way of kind of the the things it's dealing with have a way of kind of getting under your skin so as you can probably imagine <clears throat> it is the setup introducing us to these two characters and their loss then the middle of the book the large middle of the book the legend of this creek and it's and the horrors that exist there and then, of course, the culmination is when our two narrators uh, eventually, spoiler alert, arrive at the creek and what happens to them there and in the aftermath. A really, really scary book. If you're looking for a thoughtful and really nightmarish good reading experience, uh, I highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> I do love clown in a clown in the cornfield corn with some cactus, cactus cooler. <laughs> no. My recommendation this time around <laughs> with a big thank you to Blake Collier. With a big thank you to Blake Collier is The Fisherman by John Langan. I, I tremendously enjoyed it. Uh, you know, thank you, Blake. I don't know, Reed, if six, seven weeks ago your thought was, I'm going to make my dear friend and co host. Nathan as perpetually self-conscious about his minimal reading right now as possible. I don't know <laughs> if that was intentional, but I kind of starting to think it was because I'm like, oh, look at me. I have so many books. Look at me. Push my glasses up. I'm going to read a 50th book this week. Meanwhile, Nathan's like, TV. 30 minutes. And he's so dumb. Meanwhile, he's like, I listen to a podcast this week. Wow. He's not a real reader. Okay. If any listeners feel that way, then I am sorry. But I'm. What about hosts? We'll talk yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is not a book. Oh, <laughs> surprise. Oh. Listeners are really Surprise, here. surprise. Um, but I... Uh, read. Mm -hmm. Nathan. Uh, right now, I don't think you've watched it, so I won't overly gush. Okay. But I will tell you, I've watched the film Sound of Metal twice. Which I've is heard so many good things about that film. Not a specifics, rarity. but... 
yeah. for me. Um, <clears throat> I, I we we don't have to linger here long, but um, I've been going through definitively the best picture films. That being one of them, I've got one left, and and one for the first time in a long time, I feel like this is just a really good crop of flicks. Mm. Um, and two. I was ready for Sound of Metal to be a box check, not because I thought this isn't going to be good. And man, it is so moving. Reese Ahmed is so powerful. Um, it is just a lovely film. It's a pretty intimate story. Uh, sure. But for not knowing exactly what to expect, uh, I got far more than that. And then uh, showed it to my wife a few nights later, and she loved it. And so, yes, awesome. Sound of Metal on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's just a a lovely, lovely little film. I badly want to see it. Um, I mean, we will eventually. My wife and I will make the you know, <clears throat> the best the best picture run that we do try to do every Oscar season. Um, but I have heard uh, of of the films that are nominated for best picture. The one I have heard the most uh, sort of affection heaped upon was Sound of Metal. So I'm very very excited to see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's great and. And you should prioritize it after you get done with your next 50 books this week. Um, we'll see you that time. It's been another installment of what you watching, <laughs> what you eating, <laughs> what you listening to, what you drinking while you're eating and watching and listening to some cactus cooler with the cloud and Gorfield. Slap that knee, stomp those feet. Take some cactus cooler, it can't be beat. Think that cactus cooler can't be beat. You know when we're on our second episode of the night. Woo! All right. There it is. So, speaking of episodes, Reed. Episodes. Today, we're into what scares us again. And we certainly are. You know, of the films we've covered so far, so I had not seen Pumpkinhead, and not seen Fortnite, so I hadn't seen many of them. But <laughs> um, you'd seen this. I had seen this. Yes, and brother, I knew. <laughs> it scares me. It's some scary this stuff. This is okay, not my so, submission, but it no. Does so here's what's here's what's interesting. The, the, the listener, the particular listener who submitted some material for us, he actually you know submitted several little stories. Um, we invited him as we like to do to share uh, a recording of, you know, one of his submissions. Now um, he's going to reference something that is not channel zero candle cove, but I want to give a shout out to our listener, David Pooler, um, heavily active in the Facebook group. Uh, seems like a, a really fun, great guy. And he has uh, submitted something that I'm going to let him take away for a, what scares us entry right now. So uh, David, let us hear your thoughts here. Back in the summer of 2013, I was working for my cousin in the New Mexico forest. He had me living in a little apartment by myself behind his parents' abandoned house near the center of town. But the whole town felt kind of empty because tourism was dead that year because of a forest fire. Now, this particular night, it was raining very hard when I decided I would read The Girl Who Loves Tom Gordon by Stephen King. And in the book, this girl is lost in a forest in the pouring rain with animals around her howling and, you know, being animals. Well, this malevolent thing is also slowly following her, creating dread in her. And I could hear the animals outside my apartment, too. And I have never felt more entuned and engulfed by a Stephen King book and it made me shut the book after like two chapters because it was too real and I'm like nope nope but it made me look at every shadow like twice for the rest of that summer thank you very very much David now as 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 you can tell obviously <clears throat> listeners might sit there and go well wait a second he just spent two well, minutes well, talking about minute. right. He just spent two minutes talking about the girl who loved Tom Gordon by Stephen King. Why are you talking about Candle Cove? And so it should be known he sub he also submitted and compelled us to uh, cover a season of Candle Cove. 
the reason channel zero but yes channel zero candle yeah a, a season of channel zero we chose uh in in concert with conversation with david we chose candle cove uh, the first season to cover now um I also want to give some love here because The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon is one of my favorite Stephen King books, and I am 100% positive that we will get to it either by a Quarterly King or some other sort of intersection. So would you call yourself, by virtue of that, the boy who loved the girl who loved Tom Gordon? I am. I am I am the boy who loved the book called The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. No, no, no. Just the boy who loved it. better the first time, right. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. You're just outsmarting the joke, Reed. That's uh, that's true. It's yep. jokes are jokes are terrible when you explain them. Um. So, um. So anyway, yes, I'm sure we will eventually get to that. Um. But I did think this was a good opportunity since he since he selected as well Channel Zero, uh, for us to talk about this show. This was the show was. Uh, uh, originally it was a sci-fi channel original show and i kind of teased this last week when we prepped uh listeners to that that they needed to be prepared to to talk about this that most of the time when you hear oh boy sci-fi original you know like there's a certain cheesy schlocky b movie grade sharks with freaking laser beams attached right. to their heads exactly exactly um that's the kind of tone that you can expect from like sci-fi channel original material but the reality is that this particular product i don't know what the intersection was i don't know actually a ton about the oh what what i do you do oh I do. Share stories about the uh, the production and I will read channel zero. Thank oh, you. This is great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a drink. No cactus cooler. It's not cactus cooler. Goes down like a cactus. Comes out like a cactus. <laughs> Man, it goes down like a. Pour me a glass of that. It comes out like a cactus too. Oh my word. <laughs> 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 yeah man okay so channel zero candle cove now do you not know <laughs> have you not heard <laughs> <laughs> listeners don't know that you're about to choke on your cactus cooler <laughs> I needed a minute. <laughs> oh, Lord. No, but okay. do you um are you aware? <laughs> I gotta phrase it where it's not gonna trip me up. <laughs> <clears throat> so um channel zero is based on the the form of storytelling creepy pastas. I am aware of that. So okay. yeah, so that that part I know. What I don't know is stuff like the production company right. and things well, like I'm, that, you, you know, but Yeah, I'm, I'm but, trying uh, to get to it. I was just asking, did you know about pasta? I did know about the creepy How yummy pasta. it is. Yeah, um, the creepy <clears throat> pasta, the scary spaghetti. Which is <laughs> which is really just weird. <laughs> yes. It's really weird. But so uh I assume you noticed having watched this for the second time now um our our chronicle buddy max landis's name attached to this i saw that yes, now yes. I, I don't mean to dwell there but nick antosca who was the showrunner for this uh he and landis years prior to channel zero finally seeing daylight had started co to conceptualize it and oh, as an anthology series okay uh, pitched it to a number of networks who at the time were like anthology series don't work no thank you <clears throat> well then antosca went and joined writers rooms for there was one specific show that i can't remember and then did hannibal as well so he oh, was yeah. on uh, a couple seasons of hannibal in the writers room well in the interim the anthology concept began to gain more steam and so they re-pitched mm -hmm. it and one of the reasons they ultimately went with sci-fi was because of um knowing they would have kind of carte blanche you know they, okay. they they had the minimum the the least amount of like tinkering they wanted to do to the show got it and okay. though the impression i get is it really took off um you know ultimately four seasons but they initially greenlit the two which was sure Cove right. and no end house no end house um right. i know you've seen all four um uh, uh ultimately the third one is what Dream Door, so the, no, the, Dream Door no. is the fourth one. Dream Door is the fourth one. Third one is Butcher's Block. That's right. Ugh. And the, they are Ugh. all 
And it's just worth noting, because I don't know when or if we will get to this show again for its subsequent seasons, although any of them are worth discussion. Um, but uh, it, it, it is really strong and consistently very strong. I think pound for pound, my personal favorite of just the stories and the viewing experience is No End House. I found No End House to be relentlessly fascinating. So did you, um, and, and this can, I don't know if you had other real specifics you wanted to unpack before we actually just start talking about Not the show. No, but, yeah, let's go ahead. Um, have you read the creepypasta that is uh, Candle Cove? Yes, this okay, one. Okay, okay. Yeah, Not I the did, ones for I, the rest of him, but yeah, I read this one. I did read that. Well, <clears throat> um, so the reason I know about the sci-fi thing is literally today I went and looked up some uh, audio interviews with and Tosca about the show. So just oh, I've okay. been kind of listening to him divulge that information. Well, you will love this in part because of how it will dovetail back into themes in a bit. Um, I assume you also saw Don Mancini's name. I did. I was going to bring up. Yeah, well, Don Mancini was a he, executive producer. Well, not just that, but he also contributed in the writer's room as well. Right, right. And they actually fashioned it sort of he referenced and tosca specifically referenced it as child's play meets twin peaks with Campbell oh Cove. my gosh right. wow right wow um and also referenced the vanishing as a heavy influence on this season okay oh wow yeah, yeah. 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 So, which so, i can totally see you know like yeah absolutely so anyway I, I thought in particular um you would respond well to the the child's play reference there oh my yeah no i i was gonna bring up and especially because don mancini when i looked into his body of work this is not a dig by any stretch but i was surprised to find how relatively sparse it was that he's not you know child's play is a you know titanic franchise for him to have launched you know in his writing career but it did not appear by imdb credits for him to have been involved in very many other things and so to see him his name pop up shortly after we had just covered Child's Play. I was like, oh, wow, Don Mancini. I didn't, I didn't realize that. To the degree yeah. that I almost wondered, is this the same Don Mancini? <clears throat> and, and sure enough, it was. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I did, like, when, and, and I don't know if you were leading up to this, but I'll, I'll share this, this one little piece, is that, so I did not watch this one in its initial run. So in many ways, I've, I've, given lip service to it uh, already a couple of times on the show that, you know, I, I enjoy myself a good sci-fi original, but usually when that happens, it's like I'm in the mood for schlock. Like when my, my wife around Christmas time, I had to walk to her and I said, Hey, when you see a movie on the DVR called letters to Satan Claus, that's not a mistake. And uh, that's quality and that, cinema. It was, it's a fun movie. I enjoyed that movie. So, but well, it name like that, how could it not be? You know, sci-fi original. That's, that's the way it goes. Um, but um, <clears throat> you know, so so that's that's kind of the tone that I thought it was going to be in, and I'm always just like, yeah, no, whatever. But it was actually the promos for No End House that drew me in to be like, hey, you know, this got a lot of love critically, and and you know, was popular. Let me check this out. And they were rerunning Candle Cove as well. So. It was, I watched No End House and Butcher's Block and Dream Door as they aired, um, mm -hmm. which, which interestingly enough, the first three seasons aired as series often do, just week to week. But Dream Door, I don't know why they did this, but Dream Door aired in a marathon, like, uh, it was either four or six nights, like two hours, hour, hour, and then two hour finale, but all in the same week, like Dream Door all dropped within the same week. Um, so I do not know the story behind like what pivoted them to release that season and then subsequently kind of cancel the show from there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I think they're all strong viewing experiences. I, I, I think they're all very compelling in their own right, all separate from one another. You don't need to see, right. you could dive into season two if you wanted to. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I find it, I find it really, really strong. Did you only see it after it had hit uh, like shutter or, or something that was your first entry point to them? Yeah, I definitely wasn't aware of it in its initial run, but um, I often reference this podcast, but uh, The Watch, one of the hosts on there is a, is a horror person, and he was referencing Channel Zero Got circa it. 
a year and a half ago or whenever I was watching it. I was like, oh, okay. <clears throat> and other than how effective it is, I did kind of like at the time, okay, this is, you know, it's contained. I don't have to commit a ton to it. Sure. It's right. getting some good buzz. I'll check it out. And I will say for me, as an adult watching this material, as a fear of God co-host watching this material that we cover broadly, right. right. I would rank the uh, season three butcher's block is a little less scary than it is just outright nasty. Just gross. But right, right, right. <clears throat> I would rank seasons one and two in maybe the top 10 scariest things I've ever watched. They are. Yeah. They're nightmarish. Absolutely. The, Kennel Cove is an, is is wild. No End House is depressing. I mean, it is. It, it really is. No, it, yeah. It oppressive. Really and in fact, I think I remember texting you one time. I can't decide if I want to finish this. Right. It's that heavy. Yes. Um, yeah. I did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want to, <clears throat> because it's six episodes, because it's a bit more sprawling than our standard fare, I want to, in brief, as best I can, um uh summarize it if that's okay uh, absolutely please go do. Ahead and do that yes mm -hmm. uh, uh actor uh um my gosh paul schneider right um paul schneider. <clears throat> yep. mm -hmm. uh, is character mike painter uh as an adult returns to his hometown uh he is a child psychologist and ostensibly is writing a book about some horrific events that happened when he was a child where his twin uh died amidst a flurry of child deaths in the town mm -hmm. and what you learn through the disappearances course... should say i mean well, the no, disappearances? no you no no, no that's three. right they're all dead no that's right the eddie the, the twin is... he disappeared yes yes, yes, yes my apologies um, he disappeared the rest they found the bodies right correct right. so so yes uh, uh mike's twin eddie um quote unquote disappeared these other children were were found dead um, and it's this unsolved thing. And <clears throat> what you learn through the course of the series is twin Eddie was killed by Mike as a youngster because Eddie had unlocked this, these nascent sort of telekinetic sort of capabilities, telepathic capabilities was, was causing harm. Um, part of this is the title of the series of this series candle cove right this tv show that is broadcast that all these kids have a subliminal response to um and what you learn through the course of it is eddie himself had with his telepathic abilities uh developed this tv show had been broadcasting it it's layer upon layer because as i'm getting lost in the weeds here what also has transpired is Eddie's psyche has connected to this otherworldly dimension that is communicating through him with him. Right. right. Um, it gets very, if I can say it, Lovecrafty and not so much in the beast nature, but in the things on the fringe of reality nature. Right. Um, Madness kind of thing. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Um, um, and the creepypasta story we've referenced in its original form is literally just in the format of a message board conversation. And it literally takes you five minutes to read if that, but it takes place yeah. in the first episode of these adults, like Reed and I sitting around with buddies talking about reflecting on this show, Candle Cove, they remember from their exactly. subconscious. And so it kind of spirals from there. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to add to whatever, um, I will say this, I want you to add to the summary of anything glaringly omitted there, but one of the strengths of the show, I just referenced the, the kind of madness idea, the, the stylization and the creature design are some of the most horrifying and yet understated I've, I've ever seen. I mean, well, yeah. Um, I mean, just the the description of the big bad in the mo in his most commonly seen form in Candle Cove is just like when we say tooth monster, like is literally his entire visage is formed by rows and stacks of teeth, 
and it is and almost blood. as and possibly more scary than the image of toothy as i came to call him <laughs> is the sound design of him. yes it's oh my gosh wicked it's gruesome whoa, whoa, whoa. just that that clinking sort of clattering whoa, whoa, whoa. kind of oh, scraping yes oh no 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 um and 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 add, is, add some to the summary what 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 about so one thing that in the viewing of it um is that uh there's also this this root at what connection does mike as a as a person have to all of this and and every episode if you watch this just in big sequence it's easy to kind of get lost in the big revelations but probably every episode ends with a big kind of shocking revelation uh the first one revealing that candle cove is not a real show but that in in point of fact from the perspective of the adults they were all just watching static that's all mm -hmm. that it was and 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 it was all just this sort of imaginative thing to the degree that they even doubted whether or not it was really a real show um and then at the end of the second episode it's revealed that mike remembers that he actually killed eddie that he actually killed his own brother he remembers that um that spirals on into uh, you know i don't want to spoil uh, I, Do I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, not for spoilers sake, but just, you know, sensitive to time. So then that spirals the residents who lost people to trying to enact a kind of a vigilante justice against him that spirals out of their control. It is then ev eventually revealed that one of the local teachers was a direct uh, sort of uh, assistant, if you will, in helping Eddie to. Mouth of Sauron. Yeah, kind of thing. Right, exactly. To try to help him kind of transact what he was doing to all of these kids. Um, and there is this sort of beast entity that it's implied. Th there, There is some questions that I could have about, like, do you interpret <clears throat> this the same way that I do? Um, that there's this being referred to as the skin taker. And from what I interpret it as, it's just an extension of Eddie's sort of psychological supernatural power that he has, that this is just a being that sort of has has taken on form and substance within him and sometimes occasionally sort of goes out from him and transact these horrible things and, and, and kills these children and uses these kids to kill other people. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's one of the big revelations is that Eddie, in point of fact, was not brutally murdered by Mike, but Mike had to stop him because Eddie was murdering everybody else um, in the name of this skin taker. And it's all wrapped up in that influential element that you mentioned about this, this show, this Candle Cove uh, kind, of, kind of thing that the kids get sucked into it and it compels them to do horrifically violent things um the, and, the and, usage of kids in groups visually in this tv show is nightmarish oh it like absolutely just, is there's some repeated visuals one of <clears throat> them all walking down a street uh the i love some of the i mean the cinematography in general is fantastic but absolutely um that that view in the woods of all these tall trees and these oh. kids interspersed throughout them and just what they do with those kids visually as a group over and over is just insane well and well, all, there's that once just before we get on, yeah. on 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 like you know would hit a scares list or something there's there's a moment that honestly is just like really devastating the first time you through seeing it i was more prepared for it this time around but uh he has like a, a kind of a love interest. They don't have like an actual romantic thing because she's married, but um, in their childhood, they had a kind of a crush on each other or whatever. And it's clear that there is something kind of between Mike and this other girl whose name I have forgotten. Jessica. Have, Jessica. Um, but th in, I believe it's episode four of the show when Jessica arrives home and is, is murdered by all of the children. Like that whole, the reason I'm bringing it up is because the kids as they encroach upon her and eventually overpower her is mm -hmm. one of the most nightmarish yeah. and unsettling <clears throat> things visually, narratively, just everything about it is just like, Oh my gosh, it's Bruce brutal and gruesome. Hmm. I was about to call it gruesome, but that would be yeah, that's, weird. <laughs> that's a new, that's a new one. Um, oh my gosh. There's a lot to this. 
show, start with some technical elements. What what do you just appreciate about the? I, I think one of my favorite things about it is while I would agree with listeners who might say like, well, it it takes its time getting a build up, and it takes a little bit of patience because of its pacing in general. Um, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I do love that they let the entire narrative breathe because I think when they encroach in with some of the more frightening moments, they have more impact as a result of it because you could go in the show a full maybe 20 to 25 minutes without an outlandish sort of scare or maybe just the blip of a scare. But then when something else comes in, like the reveal of the you call him toothy is that what yeah. it was like like a reveal of toothy or a moment where uh, you know one of the characters is taken out uh, or something um it makes those much more impactful because they've allowed the story to breathe so even though i would acknowledge the pacing can be work um i, I that's one of the things i really appreciate about the show is it just it feels sort of expansive feels almost like you're sort of engaging uh, a novel in visual form as a result of that and i, I really liked that about it well, but it also, to me, <clears throat> is indicative of uh, skill and craftsmanship because I think, absolutely, in a way, few. Because Reed, I think you'll echo this for having done this four and a half years. Yeah, yeah. The, the balance of what constitutes "quote unquote" horror leans far heavier to the jumps and the startles that's right than it does Absolutely. the dread and I, I don't mean that in a positive way i mean no i know it's why sometimes re-watching stuff it's like oh well yep that was that you know just because right. you know the jump scares mm -hmm. um i think something that's so powerful about this is how palpable they make the creeping growing dread yeah and with each layer that gets peeled back as you alluded to um there was a oh, yeah. sorry no, no sorry no please T talking about the like the dread it had been some time since i'd seen it like probably like three four years because i think that i think the first season aired like three four years ago maybe 2016 maybe, yeah so it had been some time since i'd rewatched the first season and i could not remember because i you know bit of a spoiler alert for this although we spoil so much on these shows regularly i remembered that mike ultimately ends up sort of deceased and in and, and mm -hmm. this otherworldly place to the degree that when they have him when they're doing sort of vigilante justice against him i could not remember if that was the moment he died or not mm. and that if everything like i i was just trying to remember pieces and narrative beats of it and the reason i'm bringing that back up is because that scene was so tense for me sure i i knew this character eventually dies and ends up you know sort of in the 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 afterworld other life thing trying to um you know stave off his brother from doing anything more horrendous right but i didn't remember if that happened at that moment and then he transacted everything else from beyond the grave or if it was at the end turns out it was it was more towards the end but during you talk about this palpable sense of dread that they develop that whole scene like is they take their time with it to to a degree that really raises the stakes and i feel like just when you when you feel like you've got the show in a box and you know like they're not i mean that character is obviously safe then that character gets taken out <laughs> particularly in jessica you know right um and and that that all sort of creates an undercurrent of unwellness and and unease uh well, about and, the whole proceeding and that's interesting you phrase it that way because one of the threads of the of kendall cove is how reliable a narrator mike is right and of course yes and what they do with some of his daydream sequences sometimes that you don't Lord. know are daydream sequences like i was like whoa, 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 what oh oh, oh my. okay yeah Ooh. that one where he oh my god where he the brings marionette. out the hook against oh, oh well that the marionette too. one good <laughs> lord Get, let's count them like just yeah. oh, oh, that, so ain't right. so that ain't right 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 well yes the hook on lily the daughter yes when you think he's about to literally like hook his his girl who he's we've already seen he loves but his daughter yeah we already know that this show this candle cove show has a hypnotic power that people 
find irresistible. They cannot fight against this, you know, the compulsion to do these violent things. And I think that's, yeah, you talk about these dream sequences. That marionette visual, first of all, made me jump off the couch. Didn't remember it. <laughs> made me jump right off the couch when suddenly all these like yeah. strings like sort of shoot out of his arms and go up into nothing. Yeah. Um, and so the and how one, and as much of this as practical effects too that's oh, absolutely so yeah. impressive it, terribly compelling say? i was gonna talk about freaking skin taker on fire walking down the hallway that ain't that ain't right nathan that ain't right. like he sets himself on fire first of all it's this big like foresty looking you know personification that he's in oh and how about right before that when he's like slamming himself up against the wall the the skin taker creature that creature is freaking i would rival for as little as he does in the show itself, as little as he actually transacts, his presence in the show is as nightmarish or freaky as any major villain we've covered in franchises or otherwise in, in, in anything the, we've covered. The second time watching it, there was a slightly diminished effect. But the first time watching it in the mm -hmm. culminating other world sequence where he's just lurking and looming, that is oh. nightmare inducing. Oh like my it God. is insanely and he doesn't even do anything. That's no, what's, that's the thing. Effed up about right. And and again, He's just indicative there. of their skill at, at knowing what they have and using it well. Well, let's talk about the. He breaks the, open his face. He like yeah. reaches up at one point and just peels open his like. That yeah. ain't right, Nate. That no. ain't right. Well, well, I, like I don't know. I, I hopefully it'll have some value at least to to you and I. But let's talk a little bit about that because you you referenced thinking this is all a product of Eddie. And I think on this viewing, I don't know that that was my takeaway. Now, to, sure. so, so the overarching is yes, Mike trying to investigate this thing. Well, the, the undercurrent that starts to reveal itself is this teacher in the town who is at the present day in her probably 60s, right. uh, 30 years so ago cool. when this stuff was happening, um, she she encounters and comprehends what Eddie's capable of. The details are a little too too weedy to get into at the moment, but right. she comes direct in contact with what Eddie, the twin with these powers, is capable of, and she is enthralled and kind of swears fealty to him. And as I alluded, this mouth of Sauron way to the point to the extent that she offers up her own son uh, mm. to for him to consume or kill or whatever. But that is. Yeah, that's terrible. Oh my god! And so she is the one thirty years on, protecting Mike, i.e., from attachment, from harm, uh, because her plan is by way of Eddie to bring Eddie back into the world by way of Mike's body. <clears throat> so, one, it's just incredibly well plotted, like. Yes, we are attempting to, in a very short span of time, wrestle down a six hour or four hour, but six episode arc. And there's a lot of diversions and, and nuances to that, but it's really well plotted. I love the seed of Treasure Island being his, yes. his imaginative right. inspiration for Jawbone and crew. My takeaway was that Eddie's abilities were always in there, but the bullying that uh, Tim's brother does, I can't remember the character's name. Uh, um, gosh, Jerry? I'm blanking on it Jerry. as well. It starts with a G. I think that's it. Gene. Gene. Gene, yes. Maybe? Yep. yep. I think it's um, Gene, yes. So another kid 30 years ago breaks Eddie's finger. And so what the teacher, Mrs. Booth, says in the present day is that, that these things were always there. But yes. that infliction triggers in him a new manifestation, which is Candle Cove. Now, yes. this is when Candle Cove, the show, starts happening to these kids. My comprehension is yes. Pretty much all he's doing is his is is by his power mm. but again this is how i comprehended it is when that damage occurs to him they reference a darkness that happens i think my understanding is he connects 
with a, a, a an other dimensional kind of thing, Entity, which is right. Skin Taker. Hmm. Now he manifests Skin Taker in the real as Jawbone within Candle Cove. Okay, but interesting. Now okay. I'm not stating that. I'm I'm asking. That's I'm just like, pretty, yeah, right, right. Because because it also stands to reason when when the physical form of Mike gets extinguished at the very end, they're still locked in another dimensional thing. And I, I would think if it's all Eddie and all Eddie's psyche, once there's literally no way back into the real, they would have expired in the ephemeral as well. Because that is an do interesting, you, because do you catch that? My reading this time around is that toothy is a is like Sauron, a physical manifestation of a disembodied Eddie. I do. I did feel that way. That okay. it's like so, so. Toothy is in the physical space with everybody right, else. Right. 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 Um, and that he because at one point I forget what episode or what the context was, but at one point when Toothy is visible, I think to Mike's ex-wife or to his uh, separated from wife. Yeah. Yep. He even says, "That's my brother," and right. says it of Toothy. Right. Right. So I absolutely feel that the show, it, you know, sort of calls that out. Now, what's interesting about, I'm not, I'm not going to fight hard. I don't even know that I'm going to make a case to disagree that Skin Taker is a separate from Eddie entity that Eddie taps into and then gives, you know, substance, flesh and blood, gives some version of uh, a tangible influence to the world around them um i think the show what the show has is saying does not does not hinge on whether or not it is purely a manifestation of eddie's psyche or if it is another being that he is then just giving a doorway to to be able mm -hmm. to come into everything um but what i do find interesting about what you're posing is I, I did, it did pause me. I had always kind of thought that it was just an extension of Eddie, but it did pause me when Eddie talked about Mike being alone with Skin Taker and that Skin Taker would keep him company. Well, he's my friend, you know, and he, mm. he keeps me company and he'll keep you company too. Because again, Eddie's master plan is I'm going to emerge right. from, from this psyche and inhabit your body. I've drawn right. you into this, uh, you know, this place and this, this, you know, the something that I don't know if we've been terribly explicit about, or, or maybe we have, but that Candle Cove is a TV show. It also is the the name given to the sort of supernatural realm in which they uh, are, people are transported, like Mike's daughter, Lily, uh, when she appears on the TV screen as if she's in the, you know, pirate hollow from from Candle right. Cove she is also in this supernatural place where Mike has to go and be there with her and then send her out from it, you know, right. in, you know, through the TV screen so that she goes back out into the real world. Um, <laughs> who hasn't watched the show is like, I'm out guys. What, I'll see yeah, you next like, week. Oh, no, 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 oh my God. <laughs> um, so yeah. So, you know, there's a lot to that, but I think that, um, yeah, like I said, I, I wouldn't fight hard that it's all Eddie because I think there's enough text to the show that leaves some ambiguity there of is skin taker, other than Eddie, or is it just an extension of Eddie? I think what this what the show makes more clear is that it was the bullies, and and it should be noted, breaking Eddie's finger is not an accident. Like they hold right. him down, oh, they, yeah. they they it's it's a malicious, willful sort of harming uh, moment, and that that level of violence against him is what unlocks the door, not only to his use of abilities, but to the platform in which this skin taker is going to manifest and, and come out into the world. Um, so I think that's ultimately the point of it, whether it is just something that seized hold of him and entered out into things, or if it is just purely a manifestation of his own uh, anger and, and reciprocal violence against them, uh, it's, it still does the same thing. Now, one thing I did find was interesting and we don't have to linger too long here. It's just a question of how did you interpret this? Towards the end, when Lily is sitting there watching and suddenly Candle Cove comes on the TV and then Mike, now this is after mm -hmm. Mike has sent her out into the real world and then uh, he's stuck in there with Eddie, presumably for, you know, till the end of time. But as Lily is watching, Candle Cove pops up on the TV screen and then she sees a manifestation of Mike walk over and turn the tv off 
and then the camera pans back there and Mike's not there. So it is clearly like, you know, a, a supernatural manifestation of Mike. My reading on that, and I want to see if you agree with it or not, is that Mike is not only present there with Eddie, but is actively keeping Eddie from reaching out anywhere else. That, that is not that, how I read that. Okay, uh, how do you read in it? In part because that scene uh, steers directly into some thematic thoughts. Oh, so do okay. You want All right. to let's steer there yet? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, laughing stock. Yeah, let's. Oh my gosh, that little puppet. Oh. Well, I've got to mention on a scares list because uh, I, w- I, I was just scanning. I was like, what would I highlight here? Sure, sure. The it happens friggin' twice. They do it twice. One, it's in Mike's dreamscape, his own daydreaming, and then it's in the real. The the camera work coupled with the narrative choice that Toothy forces his arm down Mike's throat. Whoa. It is the most grotesque, discomforting, expertly crafted scene. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. The, in a in a six episode run of that ain't rights that that ain't right it just <laughs> that ain't it, right it ain't no, right no no oh my right. god no 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 so your invocation of that sequence because it took me a minute and i was really wrestling with wrestling i gotta retire that word sorry and i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> use it less i was really just pondering like what what is my takeaway here and this is going to lead to uh, a question for you because because something that really rang out to me this time and we i uh you can join if if you feel like you would be here too but i'm owning that maybe i'm redundant in my thought processes but i bring up a lot uh the effect of media the effect of social media um i think it's important noting that child's play has already been invoked here and and don mancini and this this inquisition into the effect what we consume and how the effect it has on us and and what the perpetrators of what we consume intend in its effect sure um in this in candle cove specifically these children's psyche is is taken away from them their agency is taken away from them they are uh subliminally acting in murderous ways by way of this this piece of media the tv show candle cove and what reed just highlighted is a scene at the very end because mike's own daughter lily um and in fact as a fun little tech uh, technical note a production note the interview I was listening to with and uh, and Tosca today, the actual creepy pasta references these characters as a good bit older than oh, okay than, yeah, that, than these right. characters. And the interviewer asks, you know, kind of what made that choice, and he was like, "Well, once we started fleshing out the idea, fleshing out the story, it was important to us to have characters who would have kids the age of these kids when they sure, were, right, you know, right. young. So thus." late 30s early 40s so mike has a daughter for some reason i want to say she's 11 but i may be making that up but roughly that 9 to 11 zone named lily who uh you know is is at various points of the story arc uh under the thrall of candle cove um the the story materializes into mike's motivation becoming keeping lily out of the thrall of this and and ultimately vanquishing and or stopping it as well so read as you as you mentioned she gets taken that's the end of episode five i believe um and so episode six the final one is about him trying to reclaim her right and so he travels into this nether realm um and he barters with the eddie there saying if you release her i'll stay Right. This is what you want. Release her and I'll stay with you. Well, he also whispers something to her. But before he, and what he whispers is how to get Lily to tell his mother to take out his body effectively to, to kill right. him. Right. Um, but before he whispers to her, he says, this is not a dream. 
it is real. And if you ever hear it calling to you, don't listen. Mm -hmm. So the reason that's important, what maybe fuzzy memory left out for you there and remembering the scene of, of phantom Mike turning off the TV Hmm. is after that scene, you get the fill in because, because Mike is sitting there with uh, Eddie playing cards and then it flashes five months later. Sure. Right. In five months later is when the scene with phantom Mike happens. Well, then the very end scene of the piece is flashing back to what actually happened and and Fiona Shaw, who's fantastic in this, I forgot to mention. Oh, she's um, amazing. Yeah. Taking him out. So no, to me, Fiona Shaw takes out Mike, Mike and Eddie are no more. To me, Phantom Mike is, is his daughter's mental representation of when this calls to you don't listen. I'm going to be the one okay, protecting right. you and coming in the room and turning this off. This thing is still out here. This is also why I would say it's possible. It's possible. It's Eddie. It's possible. It's skin taker. It's possible. It's them in tandem. I don't totally know. That's hard yeah. to ascertain, but to me, the mic that appears there is a mental projection of Lily's who is using her comprehension of what daddy said, mm. to shut down the infiltration of harmful intent to her right right does that make no, sense I can, it does it does and i can and i can totally get behind that it's what's funny is that no it's like i did remember the sequencing um i just kind of viewed it as yeah I, yeah i i did remember the sequencing i just read the i just read the scene completely differently but i don't think it it whether it is that they go on and they exist, and he is actively still in the real stopping Candle Cove from getting out, or whether it is that what he has told her and compelled her to refuse to listen is now is just manifesting itself visually for her that she is is sort of seeing him as protector from that point right. on. Um, I think it communicates the same message. Uh, maybe maybe other listeners might disagree with me on that, but I think it's still the same message, which is that. He has, you know, in a broad sense, given of himself to say, to kind of stand in the way of this Candle Cove from ever getting her. Um, there is a version of me that likes the idea of him stopping Candle Cove from ever getting to anybody again, not just her. Um, but uh, but no, I, I think it communicates the same message that regardless of that, you know, she's she's now going to be actively protected by him, uh, for, you know, from... A, you know from now on but i think too what you what you mentioned about the you know sort of in a glance on the social media thing i i honestly i'll share this story and then people are going to judge me as a parent uh i'm learning okay i'm learning um my son has certain things that he, you know, enjoys on a regular basis, and we are active enough in what he watches and intakes enough to sort of be for it to be on the radar of is this okay or is this not? You know, like if he catches something, you know, in a session on YouTube or something, I'm going to go back and check it out, and I'm going to look and see like, okay, what's up with this? If he's interested in a video game or if he's interested in something, I'm going to I'm going to check out. Okay, what what's the scope of this? Um, but every once in a while, we get caught with something. There was one moment where I won't say what it was because it wasn't a, like an actual profane word, but uh, there was a moment where he was rattling off the song titles from some new game that he was, you know, had seen on YouTube or something. And he was rattling off the song titles. And two of the song titles were very mature statements, like the names of the song. Again, not a profanity. But just the name of the song was something that's like, that is adult. <laughs> like what you've just described is not consumable for kids. And then just exploring it with him, I was like, what's the game again? And so we, we sit down, we look at the game. The Handle game is- Co. WTF. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? <laughs> We're talking about this right now. What is this? Um, but, you know, looking at it that, you know, I, I, there's a website I frequent. I don't, you know, swear by it or anything, but it's a good resource if you just don't know what you're talking about. There's a website called Common Sense Media that mm-hmm. 
um, you know, just, just is a good sort of little profile of, Hey, if you're trying to be intentional about what your kids are consuming and not video games, movies, TV shows, everything here's, there's a good chance it's there and it'll have like age recommendations for when it's appropriate sure. or not key things that you'll need to know so that you can decide for yourself, whether or not it's engaged. Um, this particular game, you know, I looked up on common sense media and it did, it said, in reality, there's some mature stuff here. Most of the way it's presented is going to go right over most kids' heads. But if you're uncomfortable with the fact that this is, you know, a part of it, then steer away from it until they're older teens, you know, et cetera. But it shook me for a second in this whole, like, in that way, you can sometimes judge yourself as a parent of being like, man, I gotta, I gotta do a better job of that. <laughs> you know, like right. I gotta do it, gotta do a better job of pre-briefing, preempting, pre you know, whatever, uh, to that thing so that I don't get caught unawares, uh, for, for situations like that. So your, um, you know, your story there of your son's experience kind of segues into, uh, a question I kind of hate asking because it means I might also have to answer it, but cause something I really wanted to tackle best as possible uh, in our limited time here is it's easy to look at candle cove and oh these kids get manipulated by this this you know kind of subliminal messaging from a media element um and to sort of and not to inadvertently hold the mirror back here you just identified well this is a thing that happened to my son kids and there's a reason there's certain laws against degrees of marketing and, and kids and things like that. Right. Um, I'll, I'll pat myself on the back knowing that I'm about to indict myself as well. Years ago, we made a real conscious effort on, at least on my part, it was, this was the reasoning to not have standard kind of cable TV uh, oh, sure, because sure. of commercials and just knowing kids and, and advertising. And I was like, I just, I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to try to make at least a mildly mature decision here. Um, so, you know, kind of made that call. Well, um, so the question, Reed, is baked into the notion that we like to, and it's natural because we're both parents, but in a general we sense as well, we like to be like, oh, we well, can't have kids doing X, Y, or Z or indulging X, Y, or Z type of media, but because of how it will sort of manifest or what the intent of the the advertiser is or the media enterprise is but when when can you think of times and feel free to share one or other more than one if you want can you think of times when you have had your attitude or behavior manipulated by a media thing and i'll lead while i let you talk because and i just thought this the other day man, I want to pat myself on the back so hard for stupid stuff. And this is a truism. This is, this is a real thing. Like I don't have, I don't have the Facebook or Twitter apps on my phone. I don't have the mm. apps, mm. but dude, I mean, I'm just on that crap. I, I mean, I might as well. The only, right. the only difference is, and this is, you know, technical in the weeds stuff, but you know, kind of the location sharing that's possible when you actually have the app versus not having the app. That's one of the reasons I got rid of them. So it sounds really great. Oh, look at you. Good for you. Not having those apps on your phone. But I mean, I might as well, you know, the attention economy has sunk its claws in deep and, 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 you know, I'm as much a victim of its thrall. I'm, I'm as much a victim of Candle Cove as yeah, right, any of these right. kids. And yeah. it's incredibly frustrating and just we're recording on a Wednesday. I mean, it's been in the last 48 hours. I'm like, I am, this is the, the, the involuntary action it has become to, you know, Oh, I've got literally, you know, two minutes of nothing here. Oh, I'll cycle through I'll check the email real quick, check the Facebook real quick. Oh, there's that. And like the number of times a day I would, I don't want to audit myself to know the right. number of times a day no, that I do that. Hmm. And in this way, we occasionally are mature towards ourselves. And, and as we referenced on Rosemary's baby live in our lives less frequently than we should. I had this moment this week where I'm like, how much 
how much time has been spent doing this that in most ways that matter amount to nothing. Right, right, understood. In yeah. most ways that matter. Doesn't mean there aren't those ways we build our excuses for why we do it that occasionally bear nominal fruit, but in right. most ways that matter amount to nothing. And right. that's a real defeating thought <laughs> because <laughs> because of the brain pattern that happens that ramps you into the distraction, that indulges the distraction, that derails you away from the distraction, that requires you to have to get plugged back into something that isn't the distraction only to 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, two minutes later, do the whole damn thing again. Does that make sense? Right. Oh, it like, does. No, it like it is does. very disheartening and defeating to ponder how much of my brain space I've given over to Candle Cove. And I'm going to keep drilling that in because it yes. works. That's the metaphor. It's, yeah, that's what and, it is. And right. what I don't want to be is these dumb kids and their susceptibility because, you know. No, no. There's, <laughs> there's, there's the only difference at that point is they literally don't know better. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, you know? right, right. And that's real hard. Well, it's the old, it's the old argument to, uh, to, I don't know how old it is, but it's, it didn't originate here of, you know, which is worse. The, it goes back to the conversation about, I don't want to have to set this up too much because it's not the point, but the conversation about uh, that, that gets rattled around in, theological circles about in the garden of Eden, Eve, uh, being viewed as someone who was deceived versus Adam who made a willful choice to do something. And the, the substance of the argument, though, I don't want to get into the theology of Adam and Eve versus that is, which is the, you know, the greater risk, the greater danger of the people who, you know, kind of, you got trapped in something. And so you, can get dings for gullibility or get dings for any version of susceptibility or um, influenceability or those who like, I, I know this is dancing with, you know, uh, treacherous things to me. And yet I'm just going to go back into it and I'm just going to, you know, embrace it again. You know, your question of, have I ever been, you know, manipulated your attitude manipulated, or behavior yeah by like, a do you do you see it can you are you cognizant of these times or moments and maybe it's a specific instance maybe it's just a general run like i described um i so there's a silly version that my wife and i joke about the fact that uh we had a joke earlier it was a it, it was a kind of a funny thing in our household but uh around penis, thanksgiving sir? Your penis, sir. Um, around <laughs> around uh, Thanksgiving, I kept seeing these ads, and I, I won't name it because it's silly. But there's, uh, I kept seeing these ads for a particular soap product, and uh, uh, the odds are strong that you, if you scroll around through Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you have probably seen said soap product because it's gained in popularity, I guess, in the past like six months or so. But I kept seeing these ads for it. And after about four months of watching these ads, dadgum, I, like I wanted it. And and I said, you know, I want to try out, I want to try out this like hand, so you know, these, uh, these bar soaps. And my wife, God bless her, looked at me and said, why do you want to do that? And the, all, the only answer I could conjure was, I don't know, better shower experience. <laughs> Like that was like it was. It that was is definitely the more benign <laughs> end of the spectrum of what I'm asking, but it oh, works. Yes, no, but but I'm, but I'm going to get to something a little bit more insidious. I wanted to lead with something a bit jovial and lighthearted, but and 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 so as it is, like you know, I I consume, you know, I I bought the product and and still regularly use the product, and, and you I smell like, amazing and even from I, here. I it's amazing how it even co crosses through the internet, you know, yep. like and I, you can still like, wow, what is that pine tar? That's amazing. So wow. um. <laughs> so tennis <laughs> but um so you know that's kind of silly and then you know even later i was looking at these like you know art bibles that facebook kept like pushing to me and and my wife was like boy you are becoming a sucker for a, like a facebook ad which is which you know is is not untrue um and and then there's that way that sort of gives me pause, but is ultimately, like you said, is kind of benign. It's a, it's a product and advertising has worked through commercials and television and everything the same way. The reason telemarketing is a thing is because it works at least enough to employ all the people who continue to telemarket. You know, it's like that's it is because like that pervasive sort of sense of things still uh, it occasionally has success stories. 
But what if the the thing that you are constantly being pervaded with is a particular notion about yourself, your responsibilities, or the way you should view other people and the way you should talk or think about other people. And the thing that is a little bit more treacherous, um, sharing a, something a bit more personal, though it's not necessarily uh, you know, through, through media outlets or whatever, but I can recall how heartbroken I was when this friend from high school days, um, when I found out maybe like a year and a half into my college career, we were, re we were really close uh, through high school. And I found out um, in like, after maybe like a year and a half, I don't think you and I were friends yet at the moment that I found this out about this other high school friend um, that, uh, that he was gay. And I remember the first moment that I thought like, why did, what immediately struck me was very self-centered. It was very, why did he not share that with me? We've been friends for all this time. Why did he not share that with me? And when I had the opportunity to kind of talk with him about it, he very directly sort of opened up to me and shared that like, well, I didn't talk to you about it because, you know, this comment that was made in passing as a joke, you know, back in high school and, you know, this that was said, I just, I, I basically thought we wouldn't be friends anymore if I shared this part of who I was with you. And, and he was, you know, a little bit shyer about it in sort of the revealing um, and, and there is a part of my heart that still hurts to a large degree in the ways in which simply the culture I surrounded myself with, some of it, I was just, I didn't have a choice. It was just the culture I was in. Um, but the ways in which that had pivoted my, and, and this is where I'm getting to in this conversation around like media manipulation and everything is that my first immediate thought when I found out my friend was gay was oh my God, I love my friend. I want to show love to my friend. Why did he not share that with me? That was my, that was my first conscious impulse was, oh, this, this changes nothing. Why, mm -hmm. why did he feel that he could not share this with me? And then being confronted with all the ways in which my conditioning and yeah. cultural sort of complicity had conditioned him to think I would not react that way. Right. Had conditioned him to think that I would not, you know, welcome with open arms and that I would not um, just wholeheartedly embrace who he was as he has always been my friend. And just here is this new element. You know, we talked last week about the desperate need to see people and to be seen, you know, and stuff like that. And and so when I think about like media manipulation and let me take it back to Facebook. And one of the things that drives me absolutely crazy about the ways Facebook, I had something. Oh, my God, I'm not going to name the man. Uh, for obvious reasons, there is a pastor in the South, which, you know, that's a wide berth, so good luck finding him. But there's a pastor in the South that is, you know, friends in, in my family's circles. And I've, you know, I, my family has known him for as long as I've been alive and everything. And he's, you know, culturally, you know, sort of entrenched in all the same sort of, uh, you know, uh, conservative thought patterns and everything. And I never forget scrolling past a comment on Facebook that he made. And I'm going to quote the comment because it's relevant to what we're talking about. Um, and the fact that I'm not citing him, I don't feel too uh, exposing or, or unduly. He, he specifically said on there, and we're not going to pivot to a conversation about this subject, but he specifically said on there, it's, a, hmm, isn't it very curious that about the same moment that uh, liberals start talking about gun reform, we have these shootings again. And he gave that little like emoji where he was like, hmm, isn't that curious? Ex implicitly, stating that these were all fabrications and that these were all, you know, that these tragedies that were occurring were fabrications for a political agenda. And the first thought that I had to that was what I know about this man, and this will connect back to my story of my friend. What I know about this man is that he is a pastor with some absurd ideas about how to navigate broadly through his communication. But I know if he was faced with somebody in tragedy, he would express compassion, would probably like give the shirt off his back to help people in this state. And yet feels confident expressing something that I find, you know, just so repugnant. And, and we talk in this conversation, I don't know if this specifically, this is what your question 
awoke in me imaginatively. I don't know if it was specifically addressing like sort of the media manipulation, but it brought into me the ways that we are propagating things because of the influences we're surrounding ourselves that if we were conscious, more conscious of what that was doing to other people, we might divest ourselves of them, openly reject them, or at least behave in utterly antithetical ways to what those things are communicating. And going back to my friend, my immediate conscious reaction was love and embrace, but I had subtly communicated by silence and complicity in so many other ways that that would not be my reaction. That in point of fact, he, he could not be that open with me or that he, he would not be able to, to be that transparent to me. And, I, and when, I, when I think about the influence of manipulation, whether it be through you know, uh, a, a, a political agenda propagating a particular narrative, whatever that means to you, listener, um, or whether it be the you know, sort of pervasive assault when, you know, when they talked about the disinformation campaign and the influence of the election on 2016, what so many people don't realize is that was not like Russians stuffing ballot boxes. That was not what that was. It was through social media platforms hammering home like influential things, complete fabrications of, right. uh, you know, videos and, and complete fakes of, you know, news stories and, and everything. And it was this, this kind of disinformation campaign that was just pervasively shifting the narrative in that way. And that's the influence that, that took place in that way. So when people talk about like, Oh, there was no, there was no Russian meddling or, or anything like that. It's like, well, you're, you're not paying attention from my perspective. You're not really embracing what it is. And you're also probably not as I'm not. And as I definitely wasn't in the past aware of how many things are around you influencing your uh, language, influencing your attitudes, influencing your reactions um, in ways that if you think you can control it, and if you think you are in control, you are at best utterly naive and at right. worst horrendously complicit in a lot of the ways, you know, it's that, that my last statement on it, then I'll pivot back to you for reactions, thoughts, or, or maybe, well, Reed, you answered a totally different question. That I didn't <laughs> <ask>. <laughs> but um, that book um, by Dolly Chug, the, the, the person you mean to be, right, right. You, you intend a very different thing than you are transacting in the world um, because you intend to show goodness, show faithfulness, uh, do justly love mercy and walk humbly with your God, if you will. But, but there are so many things standing in the way that you have got to confront, that you have got to own, that you've got to repent of that you, and, and some of it is as subtle as not doom scrolling through social media sure. and actively divesting yourself I said that was the last thing I was going to say. The last metaphor I'll use is that I've heard before. My friend Wes has shared this with me. I don't know where he heard it. I think he was saying that he had heard this somewhere that you can choose to kill time. And that is literally what it is. I'm going to take time that is mine, that is finite in this world. And I'm going to literally just kill it by wasting my time with a distraction. Or you can choose to spend time which might be a little bit more intentional. I'm going to spend time on a project or spend time watching a movie or spend time playing a game, all of which can be very intentional and would certainly be healthier than killing it. Or you can choose to invest time and do something that is, uh, you know, to a degree furthering or enhancing the world around you. Uh, you really rocked me back on my heels last week with your observation of, you know, I'm in my life. Mm. I'm, I'm here right now. It is slipping, sliding and, and gliding around me. And I, and I am in it at the moment, yeah. you know, and, Let's and the ways in which, yes. And the ways that that challenges me holistically. I've talked well, it's a fun. It's no. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, social media is garbage is from the spawn of hell, but, um, <laughs> it's funny. I'm, I'm glancing at my notes real quick and, and under my themes, it's jumping out at me as, as Mrs. Booth's she has a monologue in episode five, but one line of it. Uh, so Mrs. Booth, who who gets enlisted effectively by Eddie uh, to become her harbinger or his harbinger in the world. And 
to the point that she again as mentioned previously uh offers up her own son in sacrifice to that end and she says nothing sadder than a life without purpose mm. and it's really interesting because like how often do we especially in faith circles use that kind of charged language to direct the path of our life and so what all i'm trying to set intention here is the the film slash the show posits booth is incredibly heinously wrong you know for her, her actions and mm -hmm. her her banner of of direction is this nothing's sadder than a life without purpose and what you just said is I am in my life and there's a world where I can see those as, as, as poles mm. mm -hmm. because I mean, think about it. Like nothing sadder than a life without purpose. How many, and, and what I'm not doing actually right now to be super direct and clear is, it is propping up something like purpose driven life. I actually think a lot of Rick Warren. And so that's not what I'm after here, but you know, right, right. some of that language is there, but actually what I am propping up is just, the idea that productivity gets positioned as faith, mm. like how much we, how much we prop up, you know, whether it's something as old school as saving souls, right? Whether I don't even know what the newest version of it would be, but it's of, you know, being relevant, although that feels 20 years ago at this point. Mm. Um, the point being, we try to paint purpose over what's just meant to be lived in. Right, right. Mm. And, you know, call the one hippie and the other God or something. Right. And just like right. what the show the show doesn't position those things against each other intention i am identifying booth says charges her language and her actions with this purpose idea and you know what is and as i think that through what is the what is the counterpoint to that and it is stillness it's being present in your life versus driven by a thing i'm sorry go ahead no 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 it's just, so so what is um this is clicking for me sometime, some, somewhat in real time. I, I cannot believe I've watched this show twice now, and I didn't think about this aspect of it, and I don't know if it'll go much of anywhere. But as you're talking about this kind of thing in purpose and intent and everything, um, I don't go totally in for this, but I find it fascinating, especially when I have a weird dream, um, to look up if there was weird imagery in my dream, what the dream mm -hmm. imagery means. Um, and, you know, who knows what your subconscious is playing with. But Many, many people have recurring dreams uh, where something's going on with their teeth. Uh, their teeth are falling out or their teeth are breaking. And what I've, if, if I'm correct about this, I'm trying to remember because it's only clicking for me in real time. I thought, I thought about the fact that like, you know, the skin taker is he, he, taking teeth and, you know, mm -hmm. the tooth monster and there's, there's all this teeth imagery. And if I remember correctly, the supposed interpretation or the most common interpretation, if you're having a dream where all of your teeth are falling out, it's that you're losing. Every, mm -hmm. everything is you're you're you are uh losing your grip uh feeling insecure it's that kind of thing like you are mm -hmm. you are uh not at home in your own skin you know so, so to speak i don't know if there's a lot of intention behind that those whole connections or not but so much of what you're talking about about like this whole like mrs booth is willing to embrace purpose regardless of what that purpose is because she's you know now she's taken this place to where um you know, she, she sees now her intention as I'm going to, to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to position and propagate m multiple like homicides and deaths and, and, uh, and, and the corruption of these children, right. um, and, and cast it off as some sort of intent and purpose as if this right. was somehow noble, as if this was somehow good, um, and I feel like 
there's many ways in which the whole conversation around means and ends can result in some pretty, pretty nefarious representations of, uh, uh, you know, what we deem to be like the greater good or, or, you know, purposeful types of behavior and action. And, and I feel like what I'm putting together in this moment, if I'm right about what dreams about losing teeth and breaking teeth means being like insecurities and loss is what the bullies or what the people like pulled out of Eddie when they broke his fingers and when they sh just embarrassed him and shamed him and wounded him when they did that, then it gave manifest to this thing that had to like sort of reclaim all of that, all of that loss and all of that security back. And I think about that in the context of why does Miss Booth get sucked into it in the first place is because she, she suffers from epileptic, epileptic seizures mm -hmm. and he puts a stop to it. Right. And and I'm I'm layering some things onto the text of or layering some things onto that narrative that, that maybe the show doesn't explicitly state, but you know there could be this understandable feeling of like, well, if I have an epileptic seizure in the middle of a a classroom, that's a it, it, you lose control. You don't you don't you know you're not in fact you're you're not in control of your body. Uh, right. For many people, they may find that embarrassing, and and you know regardless of how normative and how uh, you know inescapable that kind of condition would be to mature, responsible viewers of it, if somebody was in the throes of it, um, it's still a very sort of debilitating probably experience for people who suffer from those kinds of seizures. I don't know because I've never experienced that. So if anybody uh, listening says like that's not that experience, forgive my offense. I'm trying to sort of explore this. Um, but it, it seems to me that this notion of embracing that thing to sort of regain some control over a thing, no matter the cost to other people and the lives that you're ending and the lives that you're harming around it. I mean, like in many ways, I feel like when people get, I'll bring it back to social media, when people post something like that, or they, I think honest to God, they feel like they're being bold. And I think they feel like they're being in control. Like I'm, I'm doing something, I'm making a choice, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to be at the behest of all of this. I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I'm going to state my thing and I'm going to put it out there in the world. And, and, and I'm just going to, and if people, you know, don't, don't get me or don't understand me or whatever, then, you know, forget them, skip them. And I feel like that's what the illusion is, is we are so to put it more succinctly, if I'm not making a lot of sense is that God, we are so susceptible to the illusion of control we are so susceptible to being drawn in of like you have the power this is your wall this is your page you know like you have all the power you have all the control when in point of fact to quote of all random people denzel uh in a in an interview that he gave where he said you really have to ask yourself are you using your device or is your device using you sure um and you're just, uh, you're just handing your teeth over <laughs> yeah, like fundamentally. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, like, I don't have much more to say about it except that, you know, it's, sorry to not have like a real profound bumper sticker to add to that. But that's what this is all conjuring up for me is just the, the ways in which we are so sucked in to the illusion of control. And I do wonder, I mean, at the risk of maybe trying to scratch at something hopeful and substantive to land on it is, is, the, the power and freedom to embrace the reality that there are so many things we can't control and to embrace that, that truth of like, yeah, that uh, it's, it's calling out to me in this moment, the, the invitation that Christ gives to us to be like, look at the, look at the wind. Like you can see where it's, you, you, you see its effects, but you have no idea where it's coming from or where it's going. Like, the remember the lilies of the field they don't they don't toil they don't spin like how many times does christ compel us like to live in our life yeah abandon this illusion of like control and abandon this illusion of uh manipulation and everything like abandon that be in be in your life you know live in your life and 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 I don't want that to mean that we don't have any agency it's not a, a nihilistic thing to say like oh well I'm going to get apathetic about everything and never make a choice because I can't, you know, cause I can't control anything. I think there's just a profound Liberty to recognizing like, no, I don't. Well, I, 
I'm sorry. No, no, no. Just because uh, I'm because I'm kind of rambling at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think it's not. If anything, Candle Cove robs you of agency. Right. Living right. in your life means means every choice is loaded with agency because it's you that's choosing it, and mm. you know it is the roar do a thing because it's true and not because of fear of punishment or promise of reward like right right that's the definition of agency absolutely you no know? absolutely and and these external influences that exert control that we think we still are uh able to stand against it's just foolhardy um right right to use a perhaps maritime idiom uh, <laughs> bringing us back to old candle cove um <laughs> uh yeah i don't know i i think i think there's a lot here um I, it's funny just a moment ago you was like you you was like you was like all of them was, witches um like. <laughs> <laughs> but on your satan shoes we're gonna read all of them witches <laughs> um uh, a moment ago you were positioning as hey i don't want to leave it all negative but what's interesting to me about channel zero is it it thrums at this very borderline nihilistic kind of energy right uh as is so, the spirit of creepy pastas which it's based on because sure. they do they do not leave you with a happy ending yeah they, they are they yeah. are meant to rattle you they're meant to, you know, like spook you. And but I like the idea of us manifesting our own mental image that stymies our indulgence of Candle Cove. I don't yeah. know exactly what that is for me at the moment, but something that steps in and says, turn this off. Right. So, something, whether it be conscious whether it be spiritual, whatever, something, something that steps in and says, you, you turn that off, like be, be, be here now and, and be present and don't, and, and don't give, don't give sway to, you know, the jaw bones and the laughing stocks and, you know, all of that kind of thing. Like just, you know, and, and that, that is whether it, whether I, I don't know which one of us is right. And we weren't really competing very hard for, for our disparate interpretations, but I do think that is the point something some conjuring a mental image to just step in and turn it off for you yeah i think that would be a profoundly healthy thing to visualize it's just like you know if you can't do it yourself uh then visualize something steve that rogers exist. yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah just just have him come in Cap captain america turning the chair around and say yeah exactly so you, that's so what it was candle cove. so you want so you want to go to facebook <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh not now oh gosh. nathan <laughs> okay. okay cap and we're being a little jokey about it but no, i actually I, think there's probably, yeah you know there's there's probably a real there's probably a real uh substance to that sort of idea um so yeah i like it candle cove i like I'm it good. too I'm good i am there. too you want to go to the fog meter you want me to explain it sure you want great to? okay all right so fog meter is our very special our very specific i don't know how special it is but it's very specific it's very special it's very special um, metric of fear and God in which we rate the material we cover, whether it be TV show in this case, or movie or book or whatever on fear and God, it's scares and it's substance. Um, so covering today, channel zero's first season called candle cove, um, on the fear measurement, we've talked about this, uh, repeatedly, maybe not as emphasized as, as we probably could have. This is a freaky show. It is scary. It is Scary in its narrative, scary in its monstrous visuals. Uh, it's really freaky. I'm going to give this a nine. Hmm. Yeah, we didn't talk about all of it because there's a lot. Like, you, there are so many moments of just like, oh, my God. Oh, God. And, and Jeez. I mean, I remember, to, I think it was today, this morning, it's episode six when the marionette happens. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't remember this. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a freaky visual man oh uh, yes it is um oh, mercy i mean i wasn't being hyperbolic i think now i mean the show writ large but this was my entry point to it and i would have said that then 
I think it's one of the scariest things I've watched uh, in, in my growing capacity to appreciate this stuff. This is an easy one to point to. Um, I'm going to give it a 10. I'm going to give wow. it a 10. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say for the God meter for its general substance? Um, I think, I think maybe some of what we were meandering through is partly because I don't know that there's a super rich thematic heartbeat to it. I don't think there's nothing. I don't mean that, but right, um, right. I think it's just a really well crafted and told story. Um, and beyond that is just kind of what you want to find in it. So uh, I think I might uh, give a five on the God Factor. Right. I'm actually not, I, I'm not far off from you. I feel like I struggled a bit to sort of land at what it was saying other than like just telling a really compelling story in right. terms of the themes it's trying to explore. I think you have to do a little bit of digging for that out, but that having been said, I do feel like even the things that we were exploring feel so big as subjects that I, I kind of want to be a bit generous to it. I'll give it a six cool. um, uh, just in, just in that regard. And that means that we give candle cove season one of channel zero, a seven and a half out of and that gave rosemary's baby that week. is exactly what we get so you know what <laughs> on the same shelf with yeah. landmark legendary film yeah. rosemary's baby you got channel zero well, that's a fun romp Candle this is Com scary that's, that's right this is this is freakier <laughs> than rosemary's baby uh because it's rosemary's baby it's not the devil's baby yeah. um okay so um but the biggest you know question on top of that or you know extending from that is would you recommend candle cove or channel zero in large um absolutely i think I feel like I remember texting you this when I was walking through it the first time. I'm like, this show is so our people. Like, yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, yes. In a way, because at the same time, I'm feeling a little two faced because I, I haven't watched enough of something like an American Horror Story to be able to speak to that. But it feels yeah. like a very different energy to it. Um, mm. Mm. A very different energy. Yeah, yeah, like like Channel Zero. For someone who would attempt to poke holes in the veracity and quality of horror as a genre i'd be like you need to watch this because yes, sure right it's palette it's it's accessible in terms mm -hmm. of it's it's not over long it's it does incredibly well what it does and mm -hmm. what it does is intense and freaky so yeah i definitely I, recommend it to so i i'm i'm in agreement with you and to the american horror story sort of comparison like for for anybody who might find american horror story to be just too mtv like too energetic and too uh bombastic and in your face you're ready for something for, it's a little bit more like vh1 is that what you're VH1. trying to say you're yeah, trying to say channel zero is the vh1 of no no, horror no, no. tv oh, okay no 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 um <laughs> I would, but it's like channel zero is just a lot more like thoughtful deliberately paced um builds a stronger sense of dread um and 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 is definitely very effective to that end so it pushes a lot of the same buttons but with a you know a, a much more deliberate and intentional pace um and yeah I, I highly recommend it i think it's i think it's really freaky uh for those who like their if you are concerned that like you know like we've already addressed on the show that like oh i don't know that i'm in for like a big downer thing i would say that the first couple of seasons end you know in in real sort of downbeat ways the third season, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think the third season has a kind of an uptick there at the end. Um, and the fourth season, I definitely feel like like the last episode, I wouldn't, it'd be a stretch to call it a happy ending, but it ends on a much more up note than the first two seasons do. Um, but uh, I don't know if you would agree with me on season three or not. But I almost didn't finish season three. It's so nasty. <laughs> it's, it's so, so gross. awful. It's so gross. It really is. So, um, all but anyway, I can think of so, is people eating people. So I don't, I don't uh, remember how it ends exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, that was, you know, our conversation about season one of Channel Zero, Candle Cove. All four seasons again are available on Shutter, or I think you know for rental prices if you don't have that service. Um, and uh, so yeah, that puts another well, edition. Should of, we thank? You might have been doing this. I'm I sorry. was about to do that. Do so, it. Go uh, for it. Yeah. So I would like to extend a big thank you to listener David Pooler for not only submitting his, uh, you know, what scares us story about the girl who loved Tom Gordon, which is one of my favorite Stephen King books, but also for uh, compelling us to cover season one of Channel Zero. We really appreciate you, David, and thank you very much for your submission here. Next week, we're going to be going to another What Scares Us submission. And if everything goes according to plan, might have a special guest. We will 
leave that uh, pending at the moment, uh, reserving the right that if schedules change, we might hold this back a little bit. But if all goes according to plan, next week, we will be visiting uh, the sleeper independent film Session Nine, which mm. uh, is, uh, I did no not idea. look... Well, and I, di I didn't look this up. I believe the director's name is Brad Anderson. I'm gonna feel so stupid if it's not. But you know what? I'm just I'm I'm in it. I'm in go my life. Go for it. You're there so now. I'm just, yeah. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go for it. Yeah. But uh, but the you film I know the life. name of is uh, it was submitted to us. It's uh, by by a very special uh, individual who might be joining us for it, um, and that is Session Nine. So tune in for that next week, and we will see you then. Nathan, thank you as always for having these conversations Absolutely. with me. Listeners, thank you for going along this journey with us. Uh, and and uh, as we say on every episode, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end of the conversation. And in that spirit, we encourage you to fear nothing else and be on your way rejoicing. We'll see you next week, everybody. See you. Bye.